Hi, it's Mignon Fogarty, Grammar Girl. You've heard me read ads for products that I love and believe in and introduce you to new things I think you'll love. And I know you'll love this new show that I'm about to tell you about as much as I do. Supposedly, three out of five people dream of writing a book one day. If you're listening to this show, there's a chance that you're one of them. Screenwriter John August was also one of them. He'd been successful with films like Charlie's Angels, Big Fish, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but he had this nagging feeling that he needed to write something different. The story of how he wrote his book is the subject of a new podcast called Launch. Launch is about making things and about putting something out into the world and having no idea what will happen next. Launch is written and hosted by John August, and I've listened to his Script Notes podcast for years, so that's how I know you're going to love his new show, and we have a special preview of Launch for you today. You can subscribe to Launch on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this right now. Here's the preview. Hi, my name is John August. If you Google me, you'll see I'm mostly a screenwriter. I wrote Big Fish and a bunch of other movies. Two years ago, I started writing a novel. It was something I'd never done before and knew almost nothing about. At the same time, I started recording interviews with authors and agents and publishers and everybody remotely connected to this book I was writing. I didn't know exactly what I'd do with all those interviews, but I had questions and I figured I might as well get the answers on tape. Now my book is coming out. Two weeks from today, you'll be able to buy it in stores. This podcast is about how that book got there, how I wrote it, how I sold it, and how publishing works. Not just as a business, but literally how books are printed and shipped. We'll be talking about success and failure, school librarians, book tours, typefaces, and how the shadow of Harry Potter looms over everything. As I'm recording this, I know how it all begins, but I don't know how it ends. Will my book get good reviews? Will it sell? Did I make the right choices along the way? You'll find out when I do. From Wondery, this is Launch, a podcast about making new things. I've never made this kind of podcast, the kind with audio clips and music and ads. For the last six years, I've hosted a weekly podcast about screenwriting called Script Notes. One of the recurring bits is that my co-host Craig hates podcasts. As you know, I listen to exactly zero podcasts, including this one. Me, I love podcasts. All kinds. I currently subscribe to 65 of them. One of my favorites of the last few years is called Startup. You've probably heard it. It tells the story of Alex Bloomberg as he struggles to establish a new company. Week by week, you can hear it grow and change. The basic format is that Alex talks directly to you and tells you what's going on, sort of like I'm doing now. When you go back and listen to it a second time, you realize there's some sophisticated techniques he's using. For example, This will be probably the biggest and um, most long-term project of all your projects. That's my agent, David Kramer. You just have to make that, that decision for yourself, how you see the next several years of your life. See that? I'm foreshadowing that there's a big choice I'm going to have to make a life-changing decision, and I'm going to have to make it by the end of the episode. One of my other favorite shows is called Planet Money. They did this series called The Story of a T-Shirt, where they track the process of making a T-Shirt from growing cotton to delivery. I love stuff like that. Process. So let's go back to the beginning of this whole adventure. Let's see how it all started. If you listen to a bunch of podcasts, you start to notice some tropes. Like... Whenever you hear this kind of drone, you know something bad is about to happen, especially if there's an out-of-tune music box playing. And then the narrator says something like, On June 19th, 1977, a young boy went missing in the mountains of Colorado. His family was camping in the Roosevelt National Forest along the Middle St. Frayne Creek. It was hot that afternoon. Still, average lows for June dipped into the 30s. A boy in shorts and a t-shirt was at risk for hypothermia, particularly if he got wet. The more immediate concern was bears. Black bears were frequently sighted in the area, attracted by an easy meal from the campground trash containers. 
Bears are foragers. They rarely attack adults. But a six-year-old boy alone in the woods might not fare as well. The boy's father, Hank, and his 11-year-old son, Bill, went searching for the boy. The mother, Nancy, and her mother, Helen, stayed back at the campsite. They yelled the boy's name until their voices went hoarse. This is the story of what happened to that boy in the woods. I should explain here. That six-year-old boy is me. I didn't get killed or abducted. It's not that kind of podcast, remember? This story about getting lost in the woods is really important for understanding why I decided to write this book. It pretty much explains why I am the way I am. Here's how my mom remembers that day. We were up in Camp Dick, which is a forest service campground. We'd gone up probably on a Friday night. So we had had lunch. Your grandmother and I were sitting chatting, and you and your dad and your brother Bill were going to go exploring around. So you left. Pretty soon, I can't tell you exactly how long it was, but here come your dad and your brother, but no you. And I said, where's John? John wasn't there. I probably got a little teary-eyed, like, where's my kid? Here's my brother, Bill. Mom started calling for you, and Mom was kind of freaking out, like, you know, John, John, where are you? So finally, your your dad and, and Bill decided they would go back out and look. And it seemed like it took forever. I was a smoker back then. I'm sure I lit a cigarette. You know, and probably smoked it down to the nub. You know, she was scared. She, you know, she didn't know where, where you were. You know, it's the forest, you know. You know, it's, it, you don't know what kind of animals might be out there. To my family, this is the tale of how John got lost in the woods. But the truth is, I wasn't really lost. This is what happened. See, I'd found this trail, and I was curious where it went. So I followed it. There was a little creek, and I I made my way across the rocks. I wasn't actually that far away. But I also remember, like, hearing you and not going back. Does that sound like me? Yes. (laughs) If truth be told, yes. I mean, because um, if if you were busily involved in something, uh, here again, you know, mom could wait. I could hear their voices calling for me. But there was another voice this inner voice that was louder, more insistent. It was urging me to keep going a little further to see what was around that next bend. So I kept walking. That's when it happened. I can't tell you what it was exactly. The air felt sparkly. The trees were vibrating. I had this feeling of awe, like I'd wandered into some ancient mystical site. I was six years old, and everything felt electric. I don't know how long I stayed there or why I left, but eventually I turned around and walked back. And um, here you come, back. And, you know, then I really cried because I was just so glad to see you. Something happened that day in the woods. I don't know what it was, but I have the echo of a memory this sense of wonder. I've been chasing it all my life. Maybe you feel it too? That notion that there's something hidden just out of sight, just around the bend. All I know is, I see a trail and I want to take it. I'm still that boy in the woods. Let's fast forward 38 years. This is when I first spot the trail that leads me to write this book. It's October 30th, 2015. I'm in a hotel room in Austin, Texas. It's 9.57 a.m. and a massive storm is raging outside. I press my phone against the window to take a video because it feels like a movie. Winds are howling, lightning fills the sky. On a nearby building, I can see this American flag. It's whipping so fast, I think it might tear off. It's been like this for days. The airport is shut down because the traffic control tower is flooded. I mentioned the storm because it explains why I didn't leave the room much that weekend. If the weather had been better, I would have explored the city or had beers with friends. Everything would be different. I wouldn't be telling you this story. I'm in Austin for the film festival, but there's one work phone call I have to make. Hello? Hey, Kenneth, it's John August. 
His name is Kenneth Opal. He's a novelist. He's written this book called The Nest. It's about a boy who discovers that magical insects are planning to steal his baby brother. Some producers sent it to me because they think it might be a movie. That's most of what I do as a screenwriter. I adapt books into movies. Oh, first off, yeah. is it okay if I record this? Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay. Um, when I first read your book, it seemed really creepy for what I, I had originally been pitched as a kid's book. And so I guess I was confused about sort of like what were the rules of a book that is designed to be read by young readers. Do you get that question a lot? All the time. I mean, I just came back from a, a week a book tour in Italy and uh, talked to a lot of adult audiences who had very, very profound sort of ethical and philosophical um, questions about the book and responded to it um, in ways that I was, I was glad to hear about because there's a lot of subtext to the book. Is it too, is it too scary for kids? But it, to my way of thinking, like, I, I think kids read stories in an altogether different way than adults do. And kids are, are used to a diet from their very earliest stories of of um, you know peril and and death and um, you know and monsters you know from grim you know all the way to Beatrix Potter even I mean there's you know bunnies get eaten and skinned and put in pies and and uh, people get locked in dungeons and towers and um, so I think kids just sort of accept this sort of landscape as much more normal and it's often the parents um, you know with much more life experience who <laughs> who read these stories and are actually horrified. I think he's right. Think back to the books we read as kids. So many of them are really dark. Hansel and Gretel, we all remember the end, the kids pushing the witch into the oven, but it starts with a father abandoning his children in the woods. That's like Stephen King dark. What do you say when people ask what kind of, what genre of books you write, like sort of who the audience is for most of your books? Well, in the current publishing market, middle grade is usually defined as a book for roughly nine to twelve year olds, and I, I constantly resist these, um, you know, definitions. I mean, I, I like writing books that I thought had a, you know, you could read them if you were, you know, if you were a good uh, reader at eight, or you could read them if you were fourteen. Um, so I never really thought so much in terms of, you know, the, you know, middle grade. Like, what is that? I just wanted to write a, a good story. This was the first time I'd heard of middle grade. You're going to hear that term a lot. It doesn't mean junior high. It's younger than that. To me, like the middle grade is sort of the golden age of, 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 of reading as a child. Like you never love a book as much as, as the books you loved when you were that age, like sort of that 8, 12. It's sort of that sweet spot um, for kids. Like a, and a lot of kids sort of after 12, they, sort of dro- they start dropping away. That's why I, I love that age group. It's also, you know, it's still such a great time of life it's still so full of curiosity and 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 wonder and potential and it's not it's not cynical yet um you know the possibilities are still huge in most middle grade titles the hero is roughly the same age as the reader think harry potter or percy jackson the reader can easily imagine being in the hero's shoes i mean there's lots of famous adult books with child protagonists but for me the the difference between you know an adult book and a middle grade book even if they have child protagonists, is that there's no, um, there's no gloss, there's no editorializing, there's no retrospective commentary on what that kid is doing. You know, with a middle grade book, it's like, it's like all present tense. You know, this kid, you know, is having this incredibly intense and, and, and stressful experience that he's really not equipped to have, and yet he finds all this inner strength and then, you know, becomes a warrior and, you know, defeats this, this monster really on his own. There's sort of a template for middle grade fiction. You start with an ordinary kid, but then he discovers something extraordinary, that the world is different than he assumed. He goes on a journey, and the journey changes him. Basically, a kid goes into the woods, something happens, and he's changed by it. Kenneth and I talk for about 45 minutes. I don't tell him, but by the end of the conversation, I have a new plan. If you're curious what happens next, you can subscribe to Launch on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this right now. And if you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe the album art to find a link that will take you to the show. Thanks for listening. And until next time, I'm John August, and from Wondery, this is Launch.